Stanford University. <clears throat> Welcome. Uh, thank you all for coming to uh, what is the third event in uh, this series of uh, forums that we've organized here um, for the Security Conundrum uh, Speaker Series, Balancing Security and Liberty in America. Those of you who have read your program have surmised by now that I'm not Amy Zagard. That's right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Amy couldn't make it tonight, uh, last minute issue, so uh, I'm filling in. Uh, I'm Phil Taubman, uh, and actually I was the uh, organizer of the speaker series. Uh, so I, I feel right at home here with uh, Senator Udall. Uh, I'm a consulting professor at uh, the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford. Uh, I teach a class here in spring quarter, just uh, had the first session yesterday that was the, the wellspring for the speaker series. Um, those of you who know me uh, know that I spent my career as a journalist, uh, most of the time, 30 years at the New York Times, covering national security affairs, uh, spent a lot of time dealing with these intelligence issues. So the course I teach is about the conflict between the press and the government over the handling of national security secrets. Uh, and just a few weeks after the first uh, time I did this course in 2013, uh, Edward Snowden exploded onto the world scene with uh, his revelations. So at that point, uh, I thought, gee, you know, We've got all these interesting people coming out to be guest speakers in my course. Uh, wouldn't it be great to try to set up something for a broader audience at Stanford, and especially uh, those in the community here and for students uh, at Stanford? So that's the origin of uh, the speaker series. Uh, those of you who've been here for the previous events uh, will remember that Michael Hayden, the former director of the NSA and CIA, uh, came in October. Bart Gelman, a Washington Post reporter uh, who was involved in breaking uh, some of the Snowden stories and working with Snowden uh, to uh, get his material into the public domain, appeared in October. Tonight we have the uh, privilege of having Senator Mark Udall, uh, who served uh, while he was in the Senate on the Senate Intelligence Committee, put him right in the middle of these issues. Uh, and in fact, he was one of the first uh, people, along with uh, another senator who happens to be a Stanford graduate, Ron Wyden, uh, from Oregon, to speak out in a very careful way uh, before the Snowden revelations, and we'll, we'll get to that. The notion is to explore the balance between liberty and security in the post-9-11 world. Uh, which uh, has, uh, that balance, I think, has bedeviled the country uh, ever since 9-11. It's, uh, it of course, was an issue that the United States has wrestled with uh, going back to the beginning of the country. Uh, but uh, it's become even more acute, I think, since 9-11, uh, as the government uh, has instituted all kinds of programs that uh, some of which we now know about. There are probably others that we're not yet aware of uh, and will learn about uh, to uh, gather intelligence uh, in an effort to prevent another attack, uh, but a collection of intelligence that uh, has raised a lot of questions about where the limits should be. A week from tomorrow, uh, we will have the next event, which will be uh, Judge Reggie Walton, uh, who uh, is a federal district court judge uh, in Washington, uh, but for the purposes of, of his appearance here, uh, he served for seven years on the special court that was set up under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act in 1978. It's the court uh, that considers the requests from the federal government uh, to go ahead and uh, operate these surveillance programs. Specifically, they're empowered uh, to make decisions whether to issue warrants uh, for surveillance of individuals. So it's very rare 
uh, to have a former FISA court judge in an open forum talking about the role of the FISA court. Uh, that event, as I say, will be a week from tomorrow, April 10th. It will be in Dinkelspiel Auditorium uh, at 7.30. And I think, like for this occasion, if you're interested in going, you uh, should register ahead of time. And then we're hoping, but not yet confirmed, uh, to have uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein uh, come uh, at the uh, end of May uh, to talk ab about these issues. A couple of housekeeping uh, matters before we proceed. Uh, you're familiar with this refrain, please silence your uh, electronic devices. Stanford Video is recording this event and it will be available, it's gonna be streamed and it will be available online. By being present, you acknowledge that you may be recorded. For questions, we'll follow the Common uh, Wealth Club model uh, with written questions. I think you should have gotten cards when you came in. Please, uh, uh, there'll be people coming up and down the aisle. Hand in your questions and we'll break, uh, the format will be conversation I'll conduct with uh, Senator Udall uh, and then we'll stop take questions from the audience, go back to the conversation, and so on and so forth. And I just want to thank the sponsoring organizations for these events, the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, the Center for, uh, for uh, International Security and Cooperation, the Hoover Institution, Stanford Law School, Stanford Continuing Studies, and Stanford in Government. So, Senator Udall, I uh, will introduce briefly, I already have alluded to some of what he did. Uh, the name Udall really is synonymous with the American West and with American politics. So uh, Senator Udall here represented the state of Colorado. Uh, his cousin, Tom, uh, is currently United States Senator from New Mexico. His father, Morris Udall, was a member of, the, of Congress, ran for president from Arizona. And your uncle, I guess, Stewart, right. was Secretary of the Interior in the Kennedy administration. So it's quite a distinguished uh, American family. And Senator Udall served in the Colorado House. Then he served in the United States House of Representatives and was elected to the United States Senate uh, in 2008. And sadly for his supporters, was not reelected uh, last year. Uh, so with that, let us, uh, let us begin. So let me take everybody back to 9-11. Uh, I happened to be living in New York that day. Mm -hmm. I was working at the New York Times, and uh, I, I, of course, vividly remember everything that happened that day. Uh, some of it uh, I watched on television. I rushed down to the Times headquarters to help put out the newspaper. Uh, it was a terrifying day. Yes. Yeah. Uh, people were jumping out of the top floors of the World Trade Center uh, because they'd rather die from uh, suicide uh, jumping than to be burned alive. Uh, the buildings came down, as you all know. Uh, nearly 3,000 people were killed. So, Senator Udall, in the aftermath of an event like that, and of course there was the uh, the plane that crashed into the Pentagon and the one that went into a field in Pennsylvania. How should Americans think about the balance between mm -hmm. security and liberty in light of an event like that? Yeah, I, I do agree that uh, all of us, wherever we were, but particularly if you were in New York or in Washington, as I was that day, will never forget 9-11 uh, and the multiplicity of feelings we had, trying to understand who had done this, why had this happened. And I think for many of us uh, who are policymakers, it was a time to, to undertake a crash course in understanding uh, the tools of terrorists, to try and, under, to try and uh, penetrate uh, who Al-Qaeda uh, was and, and is today. Who is this uh, figure, uh, Osama bin Laden? Uh, and then how do we respond? And there was a sense of we're all in this together for too short a time, if I can be frank with all of you, uh, which it included uh, members of both parties standing on the steps of the Capitol singing America the Beautiful and holding hands and understanding that uh, this was 
if, if not exactly a Pearl Harbor-like event, it was our generation's Pearl Harbor. My um, inclination shortly thereafter was to do what I just described, which was to understand the threat and to try and get inside the minds of those who use these terrible acts of violence that are senseless, that are unconscionable, uh, to generate political, uh, military, and economic responses. And it became clear to me that bin Laden's motive was to create greater suspicion in the world, to um, incent us to build higher and higher walls, uh, to become less forgiving of other cultures and other ways of being humans on this planet. And in an interesting way, it led me to look at civil liberties and the Bill of Rights, which I think are our frankly, our biggest, baddest weapons that we have in any of these conflicts. Because in the end, these are conflicts, competitions about ideas, about systems, about societies, about how we coexist. And very shortly thereafter, we had uh, a proposal put in front of us in the House called the Patriot Act uh, to strengthen and broaden, at least that was the proponent's argument, our capacity to surveil those who might do us harm. I was one of 60 no votes. Uh, it was an unpopular position, an unpopular vote. But I had both procedural concerns. There was a bill in front of us at 6 p.m. in the evening, and the next morning at 9 a.m. we had an entirely different bill. Phil, and that, would, that, that wouldn't surprise Phil and those of you who watch Washington. Uh, but that deeply concerned me that we hadn't had due process to consider what was in these new authorities. Uh, I also had concerns particularly uh, about some of the provisions, including the now infamous 215, uh, which was going to uh, uh, include it in its authorities uh, oversee what people checked out of libraries. And when librarians expressed real concern, I thought, boy, if the librarians in the country are worked up, maybe we ought to, we ought to be listening uh, to, their, to their point of view. But in some... Um, I believe that we can find that balance. I know we're going to explore that more as we sit here tonight. But I was very conscious of what Ben Franklin famously said, and I'll paraphrase uh, Franklin. He said, a society that would trade essential liberties for short-term security deserves neither. And I believe we were strong enough to stand behind the civil liberties included in the First Amendment and the Fourth Amendment and the Fifth Amendment, uh, including the implicit uh, right of privacy and that we would outlast these adversaries that were in front of us by hewing to those principles, not by abandoning those principles. And I still believe that today. So let's talk a little bit about how, how you got involved in this. Um, you, uh, on the, in the Senate, uh, the idea of cert the Intelligence Committee is not a, a committee that's very popular among senators uh, because there's really no political gain to be uh, had by serving on the committee. People want to serve on committees that uh, immediately affect the lives of their constituents. So how did you end up on the Intelligence Committee? I told Phil this story over dinner. I was serving on the Armed Services Committee as well as the Energy Committee uh, at the time and small business too. And I uh, had, after the uh, ill-advised entry into the Iraq War, which I also opposed, I decided rather to than to turn my back uh, on the Bush administration that I would actually uh, campaign for a seat on the Armed Services Committee in the House. And I, there was $600 billion, incidentally, that goes to the Department of Defense. Uh, and when I uh, was elected to the Senate, I made the same pitch to the Senate leadership and uh, won a spot on the Senate Armed Services Committee. However, I wasn't looking to sit on the Intelligence Committee, which is, by the way, a complement to, to that assignment. And the story I told Phil over dinner was that, was that Senator Reid called me and said, uh, Mark, I want you to serve on the Intelligence Committee. And I said, Harry, look, I want to be on Commerce. The Commerce Committee is important in Colorado because of our aerospace and uh, telecommunications sectors. And Senator Reid said, Mark, the country needs you on the Intelligence Committee. The President needs you. I need you. The Democratic Caucus needs you. Uh, we need you. And I said, Harry, I want to be on the Commerce Committee. And, <laughs> He repeated himself, and any of you, if you know Senator Reid, he's to the point. Uh, and I said the following, I said, okay, but I want to think about it for 24 hours. Senator Reid hung up between the okay and I want to think about it for 24 <laughs> hours. 
and I didn't call him back and set him straight. So suddenly I was a member of the Intelligence <laughs> Committee. Uh, and to this day, though, uh, sometimes things happen in that kind of fashion. And uh, I, I don't know that glad is the right word to use, but uh, uh, I'm honored that I had a chance to serve on the Intelligence Committee for the last four years, because these are fundamental issues that you all are here tonight to hear about and discuss. And again, I just want to underline, I think the Bill of Rights is uh, a magnificent document, and it is, it is the foundation on which our country stands, and it's the foundation on which our country will continue to thrive and meet every challenge, whether it's a challenge from terrorists, from economic challenges, political challenges. And it's a, it's a sacred document to me, and I had a chance to stand up for the Bill of Rights as a member of the Intelligence Committee. So let's go to May 2011. By this point, there is some knowledge in the United States about some of these programs. We're now, you know, still two years uh, before Snowden, but we are post publication first in the New York Times and then in the Washington Post and other papers, stories about the existence of programs that were put into effect by President Bush uh, immediately after 9-11 uh, to use the extraordinary powers of the National Security Agency to uh, keep uh, phone communications under uh, surveillance, uh, email messages, uh, I think at this point in 2011, uh, the public understanding of the breadth of these programs, uh, I think, would charitably be described as minimal. Senator Udall takes to the Senate floor, I believe, uh, and says the following. The intelligence community can target individuals who have no connection to terrorist organizations. They can collect business records on law-abiding citizens. Now, I remember reading about this, and Ron Wyden also spoke up, and, and, and thinking to myself, this is the tip of a huge iceberg. When two United States senators uh, who are members of the Intelligence Committee stand up uh, and say something like that, as cautiously worded as it was, as careful uh, as they were not to uh, disclose any classified information, that was a signal to me that there was some big thing out there that we didn't understand. So to talk a little bit about mm -hmm. how, how did you come uh, to decide to go public with this? Uh, what was your thinking about what you could say and what you couldn't say about it? One of the first... Uh, assignments uh, I gave myself as a member of the Intelligence Committee was to learn about uh, some of the programs that have been alluded to in the, in the newspapers and in the public square, but were not, uh, before I became a member of the committee, easily available to me to understand. I sat in what's called the SCIF. It's a secured part of the Hart Senate office building, and I began to delve into this 215 program, and one of the first pieces of information that presented itself to me was the fact that we were gathering some 700 million phone calls, uh, and I thought, was that a week or uh, over a month? Well, it turned out every day we were generating 700 million data sets of phone calls. I was then told, look, don't worry, uh, Mark, it's, this is metadata, uh, and we're just collecting it. We don't, we don't do anything with it. We're just collecting it. And so I set aside my concerns for a week or two, uh, but then I revisited uh, those numbers, I, I uh, delegated and detailed my, my staff member, who's been a phenomenal part of the effort I put forward, uh, her name's Jennifer Barrett, to further delve into this. And I then also sat down with Senator Wyden, who'd been speaking uh, about this matter before I joined the, the committee. And I realized it, that it wasn't just metadata, uh, but that it was how that metadata was being used. And the fact that this was a secret program and it was under, being undertaken under a secret interpretation law really concerned me for at least two reasons. One was that was the program working, but two, and it was, that it was my concern that it would undercut the public's trust in the intelligence community and what we're doing. Because I want to be clear, we need to gather intelligence. There are forces at play in the world that would do us great harm. But again, we ought to gather that intelligence in ways that fit with what the public understands. And by the way, I, I did, didn't say this earlier, but I was keenly aware of, of our history. When we've been threatened 
over and over again we've overreached, all the way back to the Alien and Sedition Acts, uh, that John Adams, of all people, embraced. The uh, author, the co-author of the Declaration of Independence, uh, embraced the Alien and Sedition Acts. We know what President Lincoln did with uh, the writ of habeas corpus uh, during the Civil War. We, we know about the, sedition, the Espionage and Sedition Acts of 1920. Uh, we interred Japanese Americans uh, during, the, during World War II. We've come to regret all of those overreaches. So I was keenly aware uh, of our history, uh, and I thought this was a moment, uh, at least for some of us who understood our history, who had concerns to speak out. Phil, to your point, it's very hard as a senator to keep faith with your oath, to respect classified information, and to draw attention uh, to these kind of programs. And that, that is the security conundrum that we, we face and that I want you all to consent, continue to call on your members of Congress to be vigilant. Uh, this, this is just too important uh, to leave it to the intelligence agencies or even to the executive branch. There are a lot of well-intentioned people in the intelligence uh, branches, people doing everything they possibly can to protect our country, but they're taking their marching orders from the policymakers, from the Congress and from the President of the United States. It's the NSA. <laughs> so uh, talk a little bit more about uh, was it a difficult decision for you and Senator Wyden? Did you think well, we, it was it was a lonely undertaking, um, and I continued to question, uh, particularly given the the rebuttals we would receive, both in classified settings from a variety of um, individuals, and also the reading that I would do, and and then my colleagues generally were uh, willing to trust and support uh, the application of the 215 program, and, there's, and I'll, I'll throw these numbers out, also 702, which is more tied to foreign surveillance than domestic uh, surveillance. Uh, but I then began to ask the question, is this, does this work? And we were, sh we were assured in many occasions that it, that it worked, but it was never uh, nailed down. And you all may remember over the last couple of years, there was a public uh, release of information of some 54 incidents where two, the 215 authorities had allowed us to uh, stymie plots or find individuals that had malice towards uh, us. But when you uh, begin to investigate those 54 incidents, there's only one out of those 54 incidents that you can really tie any sort of 215 authority uh, to, to the uncovering of that individual's actions. So not only is this law in secret being implemented, and not only is uh, every American f phone record being vacuumed up, but the program doesn't work. Uh, so why were we uh, continuing to support uh, the program? At the same time, the intelligence community decided to end the metadata program tied to email. They were collecting the same kind of data uh, that attaches to your email uh, traffic. Uh, where, when, who, what time, for how long, that sort of thing. But the NSA decided that wasn't very effective. And I'd, l I'd like to think that in part it was because Senator Wyden and I were haranguing the Intelligence Committee both in public and in private about the email metadata program uh, as well. Uh, so this, um, this was an unfolding set of uh, disclosures, if you will, and it, as, over time, uh, I became more and more convinced that the public would eventually learn about this. You would be outraged. It would undercut the intelligence community's standing. It would reduce trust. I have to tell you, I didn't anticipate at the time that it would also hurt uh, our leading companies uh, like Google and Amazon and Microsoft and, and others who have, have a presence, an important presence in international markets. And so we've seen that effect uh, as well. And there were those in the NSA who understood that that was a risk of what they were doing. Uh, without the consent of the governed, particularly in a democratic society, Phil, secret activities uh, are dangerous uh, for some of the reasons I just outlined. So let's unpack this a little bit, and I want to challenge you a little bit. Um, yes. First of all, the granted 
750 million phone calls a day, the, the sort of record of those calls, the numbers, who's, you know, what number is calling what number. But the, the government's not listening, at least at that point, to any of the conversations. Uh, the, re the records are stored. They are accessed uh, you know, only under certain <coughs> circumstances. We do face a serious threat of terrorism. So what's, what's wrong with that program? Here, here was uh, my concern uh, stated perhaps in, a, in another way. Number one, uh, these programs really didn't have the proper force of law uh, behind them. Uh, number two, uh, the information that's generated, although on the surface it's just metadata, can pretty easily be manipulated to get a good picture of what that individual is doing. There are actually applications you can go on the internet and, a and access that you feed in the metadata and they will tell you um, in pretty great detail what that individual's patterns are. Uh, and to me, that was a violation of Americans' privacy. The third factor that, that is at play for me is, look, the, the hypotheticals of, well, what would happen and who would be in charge and we haven't done anything with this data are all good and well, but history shows us that, and I, and I look, I believe government does a lot of good things for people, but history also shows us that government will overreach, particularly when it operates in secret. And the Fourth Amendment was put in place for a reason. The king at that, in that era could not only seize your property, your money, uh, your life, but maybe even more precious, your freedom. And if you look uh, at the genesis of the Fourth Amendment and this concept of unreasonable search and seizure, it's all tied to wanting to make sure that your privacy was protected and that, that uh, government and authoritarian figures uh, didn't have unlimited power over individuals and over communities. So for me, that it's, it was both, Phil, the, the uh, usefulness of this program but also the broader the principle. And I think, again, that's what continues to be important to, uh, when it comes to explaining to the American public why this isn't just a theoretical exercise. This isn't just something that they shouldn't be concerned about. This has long-term long and important ramifications uh, as to how we think of ourselves as Americans. The final thing I'll say is that privacy, which I think is implicit in the Bill of Rights, the Supreme Court has recognized it as such, is essential to all the other freedoms, freedom of association, freedom of religion, freedom of speech. Because think if, if you are concerned about uh, being surveilled or your privacy being violated or your very personal information, personal actions being somehow stored in a database, that has a chilling effect on your interest in and passion for associating with others who are like-minded, practicing a religion, whether it's popular or unpopular, and of course, uh, participating in what's quintessentially Ameri American, which is the exercise of your right as an individual to express your point of view. So, so for me, this is a fundamental right that informs uh, all of our other rights, uh, as I've said, including the right to associate the right to your own religious beliefs and the right to f freedom of speech. So let, let's stipulate that the programs uh, that Snowden uh, disclosed go too far. Where, where would you draw the line? Uh, you said that you think some uh, intelligence gathering is uh, mandatory. Yes. Uh, so if you were to design a post 9-11 intelligence collection program uh, to try to prevent a terrorist attack that was uh, a program involving phone records, phone calls, email records, internet searches. Uh, what would it look like for Senator Udall? I think some of you are familiar with the US a Freedom Act, which was proposed a year ago, that, which would put in place some fundamental reforms in, in, the, in these areas we're discussing. Uh, those would, I think, make some fundamental reforms that would increase the trust the American people have in the intelligence community's operations. They would be more effective. Uh, and again, they would keep faith with this quintessential American principle of privacy. Included in those reforms uh, are, are the following. The uh, 215 program 
phone records would not be collected by the government and vacuumed up and held, as, a, as a General Alexander said, in a, in, a, in a lockbox. He told me in a hearing he wanted every single American's phone records. This uh, is the former NSA, NSA head, General Alexander. And uh, he said it honestly and frankly, and then he, he got a little grin. He said, but I'll put it in a lockbox. Um, but those phone records would stay with the telephone companies who have those business rec those so-called business records right now. And when the government wanted access to those phone records, Phil, the government would go to the FISA court and get an individual warrant for those phone records. Uh, there is a debate about whether the phone companies is the best place to have these records. But I can tell you I'd rather have those records held by the phone companies than I, than I would the government. And I don't want to be too cute here, but just think about this. The phone companies can't charge you, indict you, try you, and Im imprison you. They can, they, there's some things phone companies could do that frustrate all of us. But <laughs> they, they can't take those steps. And given that the government is vacuuming up all these phone records, and they queried some 228 of those they made some 228 queries, I think, two years ago, the latest statistics we have that General Hayden shared when he was here. Uh, you don't need this bulk collection all held uh, in the government's hands. You can go get those individual phone records. Another reform is right now you can undertake what are called three hops. So if you find, you, you use selectors to find uh, someone that you might want to take a, a closer look at. And you can go from that person to all the people that he or she has called then all those people to the people they've called, and then a third hop to all the people that those people have called. We all know the power of exponential uh, arithmetic. Uh, that is a lot of people. Uh, that is a big dragnet. Uh, that justifies the term vacuum uh, uh, data. Of a, that would be a change. You could only go a couple of hops out once that authority uh, is given. The other uh, reform I think that would really um, make a significant difference is the 702 program surveils foreigners uh, whose email traffic comes through our American-based servers. The, and it, they surveil content in those emails. The problem has been that this so-called backdoor collection is sweeping up Americans' emails. And the reforms in the USA Freedom Act would, would eliminate uh, sweeping up Americans' email traffic. Uh, in that so-called 702 program. Those are three reforms that would make a real difference. Uh, Jennifer uh, Gracken is, is, is here, and we talked tonight about fi the FISA court and some reforms that we could make in the FISA court, including an advocate. She made a really powerful case that that might have some incidental improvements in the way the FISA court operates, uh, but the the FISA court itself needs to have better direction from the lawmakers as to the policies that are inherent and implicit in the laws in which that, that they're, uh, in effect, uh, uh, implementing. It's a, it's a one-of-a-kind court uh, that's worthy of some additional attention on the part of all of you here. But more transparency in the, in the FISA court, in my opinion, would be helpful to, again, rebuild the trust of the American people in the intelligence community's operations. What, what is the status of all these reforms? The uh, president put his weight rhetorically behind these reforms a year ago, but since then it's been radio silence. Uh, now the 215 authorities expire in June, and my prediction is that there'll be a short-term extension of those authorities as they now exist. The president uh, has limited the number of hops. I know this is getting very technical, but I think you all are here because you care about both the overarching principles here, but also the technical implementation of a lot of these laws. The president has reduced the number of hops, hops to two, but he could actually end the metadata program as it's now in force. Uh, and I have a, a lot of admiration for the president. I think he came into office in an enormously difficult time, and I think history is going to treat him favorably, um, even if some of the Republican Party haven't. Uh, but this is, a, this is an area in which I think he has much more to do to really establish um, his legacy. But right now, the Congress appears to me uh, to uh, want to punt this on a short-term basis, uh, although there's a great coalition between the right and the left and even the center to put these reforms in place uh, that I've outlined. So let's take a few audience questions. Good evening, 
Senator. We have a few questions here from the audience that we've been tabulating and going through uh, a few of these. And a good one to start with is, without uh, you now in the Senate, who uh, can we rely on to carry forward the fight? And I would preface that and add to them besides Ron Wyden. Well, here's the good news. Ron Wyden isn't backing off, but he has uh, some allies. And it's a classic case of, in some cases, strange bedfellows. Uh, Senator Rand Paul has been very outspoken on the question of civil liberties and protecting uh, the Bill of Rights. Uh, Senator Ted Cruz, uh, with whom I almost agree on nothing else, uh, <laughs> has joined the fight at certain uh, times. Uh, and Senator Martin Heinrich uh, from New Mexico uh, will be an able ally of uh, Senator Wyden's uh, on the Senate Intelligence Committee. Senator Merkley from Oregon uh, has been really attentive to these issues. And of course, the, uh, the Southern Udall, Tom Udall from New Mexico, uh, comes from that um, same tradition I do of that's focused on protecting civil liberties and standing up for the Bill of Rights. So don't, uh, don't be too worried that there aren't other advocates and champions uh, in the Senate. They do need to hear from you that, that feel like this is an important uh, mission. Uh, but those are, th th those are senators who understand the importance of this, not only when it comes to the, the effectiveness of the programs, but the principles behind what I'm uh, presenting tonight. Okay. Um, another question is, is there, is there another way Snowden might have gotten the information out without breaking the law? You know, I'm asked a lot about uh, Ed Snowden, and um, I um, think he's a manifestation of a system that was and is broken. And I think um, it's all the more reason for those policymakers to put some of the reforms in place uh, that I've discussed. I watched, is it Citizens 4? Is that the? Citizen 4, yeah. Citizen 4. And I, I, I do not doubt his uh, um, uh, forthrightness, his conviction, uh, even his uh, courage. You could see in his uh, face in that one setting when he, had, he come, had come to understand or know that his girlfriend's uh, home was being surveilled. And I, you could see in his eyes the import of what uh, was happening. That, if, by, that, by the way, is the documentary yeah, about Snowden that was done by Laura Poitras, who was the first person to whom he delivered any of this material. She's a documentary filmmaker. It won an Academy Award. It's a, it's a, it's a powerful film, and there, um, there are many points of view on, on, on the, uh, of course, the film and then Ed Snowden himself. If, if he were here, I would, I would ask him, uh, did he think through fully the ramifications of what he was going to do. Clearly, some of his disclosures uh, have had a negative effect on our intelligence community and, and on our national security. Um, I would, I'd like to ask him what uh, proposals uh, would you make? Uh, because if you, if you listen to Ed Stone, I don't think he rules out the need to gather intelligence. What he, the case he was making was that it was being done in secret without the assent of the American people that that's fundamental to a functioning democracy. I do, I do think he should come home. Uh, I know there's some very, very uh, legitimate concerns about the laws under which he'd be prosecuted, but I think he should come home. I know there are many people who would stand with him uh, and uh, make the case that these were um, necessary whistleblowing steps that he took. I think history will judge his role History will judge how he's characterized, uh, but it's, um, I, I think I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave it there. He, um, yeah, let me leave it there. Okay, so stay, Russ, there. stay there. I just want to follow up on yeah. that question, though, for a second. So let me try a, a fictional scenario on you and tell me what you think of it. I'm always wary of fictional scenarios. Okay. <laughs> uh, Ed Snowden decides that instead of turning this material over to uh, Laura Poitras and Glenn Greenwald and Bart Gelman, he's going to go to the Senate Intelligence Committee. Uh, and he's going to sit down with the committee, and he's going to say he's very concerned about these programs of which they have been uh, 
pretty extensively briefed. Uh, and he's going to say, I think the American people need to know about this. My hunch is, tell me if I'm wrong, the Senate Intelligence Committee is going to say to Ed Snowden, well, gee, we're really interested in what you have to say, but these are secret programs. We can't talk about them publicly. And by the way, most of us support them. So thank you very much. Goodbye. I think you're right. That's, you, may, you may remember at one point the uh, Intelligence Committee said they could not release any additional information about the 702 program based on Senator Wyden's and my inquiries in public settings about how many Americans had been caught up under their surveillance authorities. And the, the rationale was if they told us how many, they would violate the privacy of the people whom they'd surveilled. Do you, do you remember that uh, roundabout logic? And, and I do think that's, that was the conundrum that uh, Ed Snowden faced and, and that we all faced. I was going to keep faith with my oath of office. Classified information is classified. Uh, Ed Snowden broke the law. Uh, there are many people in the past who've broken the law as, as whistleblowers uh, for, uh, in settings of involving civil disobedience, uh, you name it. They were willing to stand up for what they thought was right and then face the legal consequences. I do wish that Ed Snowden had, um, and again, to say he had, he had advisors, because I don't know the, the sequence of events that led him to decide this was the time to do what he did. But it certainly would have been uh, a wiser course of action to think about asking for asylum if he wasn't going to stay here in, in a country like a Brazil uh, rather than a Russia or a China. Uh, that that uh, it, it makes it. Um, more difficult, uh, certainly for Ed Snowden, but also for the, the situation overall. Rest. Okay. Where will this issue of privacy versus security come into the uh, play during the 2016 elections, or will it even come, come into play? We talked about this over dinner, and as, as crucial as this is to many Americans, uh, I, I don't know uh, that it will come to the fore in the campaign, but certainly people who care about this, I think, have a responsibility, even a duty, to raise it, not just when it comes to whoever the nominees are for president, but other uh, races for various public offices, particularly for the Senate and the House. Um, this uh, has long-term implications uh, for our society, and it, it should be a front and center issue. You never know what'll, what could happen. My, my worry is that uh, as we saw last fall, there were a number of campaigns that were waged on the basis of threats to America, Ebola, ISIS, Ukraine, immigrant children on our border. I faced a lot of that in my campaign. And the use of fear in campaigns is a tried and true <laughs> political tactic. And uh, those of us who are advocating to protect our privacy, I think, do it out of more lofty motivations and principles than trying to trying to scare people. Uh, we respect and in, in many ways venerate privacy in the Bill of Rights. So I my worry would be that it would be a part of the campaign next year uh, in, in the sense that some would advocate for limiting our privacy and spanning the surveillance state, that we need more intelligence to keep, keep us safe, that we have to give up our freedoms to be secure. And I, I think that's a false choice. OK. Do you have another one? I have a Quite a few. OK, go ahead. <laughs> um, how can the intelli Intelligence Committee do an effective job on oversight? Sorry, the doctor's handwriting. Uh, how can the Intelligence Committee do an effective job on oversight of uh, the intelligence agencies when the agencies control what the members of the Intelligence Committee can see? That, that's the dilemma. Um, that's uh, what I want to, again, advocate for here tonight, is that we have to encourage those members of the Intelligence Committees in both bodies, the House and the Senate, to hire really aggressive, committed staff members, because you are dependent on your, on your staff to do their research, to be there day in and day out. It's one of the wonderful uh, elements or the wonderful uh, opportunities, Phil knows this, of being a senator in particular, but being a House member, is, is you have a lot of policy matters to which you're drawn. You have a lot of policy responsibilities. And you can't 
dedicate yourself to just one policy area. So you need a really strong staff member to shoot straight with you, to do the research, to visit the intelligence agencies, to network, or to work with the private sector, uh, to work with the academic world. We were talking over dinner, uh, given we're in the Silicon Valley and we're in the heart of the tech revolution, not just in our country, but in the world. One of the checks and balances, I'm always looking for the checks and balances, by the way, in our form of government. There are a lot of hidden ones. There are a lot of ones that you don't, in grade school, Phil, you don't learn about, but they're, they're suddenly there, is the private sector uh, has an important role to play in oversight. In a sense, that's what the private sector has done uh, over these last few years, is stand up for itself and say, en en enough already. Uh, this, this is an overreach. Uh, the le the uh, chairman of le uh, level three, which is an internet backbone company in Colorado, came to me quietly uh, a few years ago, and, he, and he, he knew I was on the intelligence committee, and we were able to get to a classified setting. And he said, look, I'm outraged at the fact that I'm being told I have to give access to our overseas servers uh, so the NSA can collect all this data. He said, it just, it just worries me that we're doing that. I don't see the effectiveness of it. I don't understand what the legal authorities are, but I'm being told by the federal government that this is what I have to do. So the, the, the point I'm trying to make is there are other places to look to create checks and balances that would provide some oversight function, given that you've only got 13 members of the Senate that sit on the Intelligence Committee, and I think a like number on the House. There may be a few more House, House members, but that doesn't mean those members shouldn't be held to account to do the oversight on those committees. One other comment I'll make is that Every member of Congress can go be briefed, can go to the SCIF, can uh, engage uh, in that work. But again, the demands are, are so numerous, and there is an inclination to uh, want to trust the intelligence community and just let them do their work. And there, again, I just want to underline, there are a lot of amazing people in the intelligence community, but they need great leadership, and they need leadership that understands that the ultimate power uh, and the ultimate weapon we have is, is, is the Bill of Rights. I know you'll, you'll probably get tired of hearing me say that tonight, but that's, that's a strong belief I have, and we need leaders that understand that. And look, it's easy to hear the Bill of Rights when times are good. It's more difficult when we face real challenges, but that's when, when our mettle is tested. And that's also when we've overreached historically. I shared some of the examples earlier, but there are also examples of when we've we've held back and, and hewed to those principles. I was a little concerned, and I'm riffing here, Russell, you stop me, but I admire General Hayden, but when he was here, he talked about the totality of the circumstances. Phil, I think you were here That's that night. That's a phrase he used a lot. He used that a lot, and it basically is uh, situational. If we get attacked, we're gonna set aside all of the principles. Not, not putting words in his mouth, but that's what I heard him saying, is we'll be situational and relative in the way we apply our laws and the Bill of Rights and our principles. I think that's a really dangerous road uh, to go down. And we know that uh, we have gone down that road on a number of occasions and we've come to regret it. Let's talk a little bit more about the, the congressional role here. Uh, just a piece of history, uh, there were no intelligence committees uh, yeah. until the 1970s. Uh, they were set up uh, in the wake of the Church Committee uh, in, the, in the Senate and a similar committee in the House uh, that uh, reviewed the abuses uh, of American intelligence agencies uh, in primarily in the 1960s and 70s, using those agencies uh, to monitor anti-war activities in the United States, a long laundry list of uh, activities that were perceived uh, to be abuses. Uh, prior to that, uh, the uh, mechanism by which the intelligence agencies were uh, supervised or overseen by the United States Congress uh, were a handful of uh, leaders, Speaker of the House, Majority Leader in the Senate, tiny little group that would occasionally get briefed about what was going on. So. Uh, the committees were set up, and in my experience, I wrote a lot about this in my uh, years in Washington as a reporter, watched it as an editor there. I think it's a very imperfect system. And, yes. and uh, one of the things that's always struck me uh, is that 
Uh, there are exceptions, but by and large, those committees will get the briefings from the intelligence community, uh, and they may question things uh, privately in the secure uh, rooms where the uh, meetings take place, but they very rarely will say anything publicly, uh, and often, as the question implied, uh, they're limited in what they know, because what they know is what the intelligence agencies tell them. So if you, if you had to improve the oversight system in Congress, which is really critical because the executive branch is going to run wild often on uh, intelligence activities. They don't have an internal break. Uh, how would Congress change the system to m m be more effective? Yeah, you, you heard me uh, diverge from the question and talk about other ways in which to help uh, the oversight function. The, the one thought that comes to uh, my mind would be some additional staff for the senators and the House members uh, involved. The other uh, way, that, and we talked about this earlier today, was to clarify what the laws actually mean. And that's why we need reforms, because those laws, if they were reformed, in some of the ways I outlined, and there are a series of other proposals out there, would uh, change the direction, if you will, that's being given to the intelligence community as to how they, how they operate. And some of the oversight functions that were lacking because of the complexity uh, of the laws and the, and the time demands that we have on us, uh, you would see that that would be a form of a solution. But Phil, that's, that's probably um, cause for a much greater okay, so conversation. You're, you're a member of the committee. How many staff members do you have who are assisting you on intelligence yeah, I've issues. Got, I've got one staff one. member. So think about that. Yeah. You know, here's the United States Senator. One staff uh, he's member. got one staff member uh, dealing with issues in, involving uh, huge programs, uh, hundreds of thousands of employees. $80 billion dollars a year. Well, actually, that, to be fair, that's the, there's a big sector of the intelligence community that's military. Um, and that includes the military, but it, what the CIA and the NSA right. and the right. NRO and the NGA all have is not insignificant, it's still in the tens of billions. So uh, explain, you know, I think it's a puzzle to a lot of people. Um, after he became president, uh, President Obama essentially continued almost all the programs that uh, George W. Bush put in place uh, after 9-11. Uh, and then he kind of doubled down on this uh, by going after journalists. Uh, there are more uh, leak investigations and prosecutions involving journalists in the Obama administration than all previous presidents combined. Uh, he's operating this very extensive drone program, which raises a lot of uh, troubling questions about uh, how we operate the drones, uh, whom we target to kill. Uh, he is in a position, and he executed his uh, power uh, by ordering the uh, uh, killing of Anwar al-Awlaki, an American citizen who was perceived to be a supporter of terrorism. No court ever considered the case against al-Awlaki. I'm not here to argue that al-Awlaki, uh, you know, was a, a, a good figure, uh, but. I do wonder about a society in which the President of the United States, on his own uh, authority, can order the essentially assassination of a fellow citizen. So you were watched all of this. You're a Democrat. Uh, what gives? How did this happen? As I said earlier, I think the President has, let's see, what is it? It's April 2015. He has uh, another year and a half. Uh, to really put into place the principles and the reforms that he's, he's addressed. I mean, one of the first things that he did was make it clear uh, that we were um, going to end any of the uh, rendition and uh, torture programs that the CIA had conducted. He's talked about the reforms that t the 215 and 702 programs need. He said that the USA Freedom Act uh, had his full support, which would include the reforms to the FISA court system that I alluded to earlier. So he has a chance to put some of those reforms in place. 
and really make a statement. Whether he will remains obviously to be seen. I think what happens, Phil, to get to your question, uh, is that uh, that man in the, in the White House, hopefully we'll have a woman in the White House soon, by the way, but uh, it's about time, don't you think, 200 and some 20 years. Um, but the individual in the White House hears day in and day out the threats to the American people. And here's day in and day out that here are the mechanisms, here are the programs, here's the work we can do to protect America. And uh, over time, uh, defaults more and more to the side of the, the equation that's security versus freedom, at least to somebody like me, to some of you here in this, this room. And the lessons of history as important, as compelling as they might be, are overcome by the emotion and the feelings and the experiences of that particular point in time. So I'm not giving the president a pass, but I am explaining why I think it's hard for any president uh, to not be at times co-opted uh, and influenced by the feeling that, well, let's, if we're going to uh, err on one side or the other, let's err on the security side of the equation. And particularly after the events of 9-11, even though that's now some 14 years ago, almost 14 years ago, uh, that, that rides around with all of us, and particularly the President of the United States. But that's all the more reason that those of us who care about this ought to be making the case, not just about the morality, not just about the constitutionality or the legality, but about the effectiveness. If these programs aren't effective, and, and we're breaking faith in all these other ways, why are we continuing to implement them? Russ, do you want to turn back to the audience, please? I'm going to take this question and veer a little bit off topic, but I think it's... There's no topic that's off topic. <laughs> it's very relatable to you. With the prerogative of parliamentary immunity, you could have released the full 6,000-page version of the Senate Select Committee's report on interrogation beyond the summary published in December. Why didn't you do so? Mm -hmm. Which would have followed Senator Gravel's example? Yeah, Gravel, uh, yeah, Senator Gravel, Gravel. Sorry, Senator yeah. Gravel's example of the Pentagon yeah. Papers. Yeah, thank you for that. Is that the, that's the full question? That was it. Thank you for that question. That was another mission that that I embraced. Um, I didn't, uh, day in and day out, have very elevated feelings about what we did uh, on, under President Bush and uh, President Obama put, brought it into it. But I felt it was very important to uh, bring the CIA's actions uh, to the attention of the American public uh, and ensure that we never again tortured fellow uh, human beings. It was a long journey. Uh, it took six years uh, to uh, eventually see that torture report declassified, which happened very, uh, very close to the end of the, this last year in my tenure in the Senate. I was prepared to read the entire 6,000-page report into the record if it looked like the uh, forces that wanted to prevent that report from being declassified were going to be successful. Once uh, the group of us that had worked in so many ways to ensure that that report was going to be declassified, knew we were going to, we were going to be able to have that report released by the end of the year. And that included, by the way, your own Senator Feinstein, who was uh, stalwart in this effort, Senator Wyden, Senator Heinrich, Senator McCain, who speaks with real authority on this matter since he was tortured. When it became apparent we were going to be able to have that report declassified, uh, I came to the conclusion that uh, I would focus on making sure the report was broadly uh, released, that it was broadly uh, advocated for, that people knew that it was now in the public square. And I felt like uh, to take that extraordinary step, uh, although it was one I was willing to do if the report wasn't going to be declassified, wouldn't help the cause. Now, I have called on for that report to be fully declassified, all 6,000 pages. I've called for the Panetta Review, which some of you are familiar with, which was the internal report that basically confirmed what the Senate Intelligence Committee's uh, research uh, concluded. Uh, and, I've, and I've called on uh, Director Brennan, for whom I have no personal 
animus, but nonetheless I've called on for, for Director Brennan to resign because it's time for cultural change in the CIA, and I don't believe with him as the leader we're going to have that kind of cultural change. Okay. After exhaustive external uh, invest investigations, was the conclusion that uh, NSA broke any laws? I'm not a lawyer. Um, I don't know that um, the NSA, I can't speak with any authority whether they've broken any laws or not. I do think the important point, though, is that we ought to move forward. Let's put these reforms in place. Let's ensure that the NSA is operating not under the, the secret interpretation of the law as it was uh, until recently, but certainly there are other intelligence community activities where I believe the law has been broken, most notably uh, in the CIA's uh, rendition and detention program. But that, as far as I know, this, the NSA has not broken any laws per se. Uh, when Bart uh, Gelman was here for the uh, other part of the security. Hey, by the way, I'm when I say that, I'm talking specifically about 215 and 702. Uh, there, there are a lot of other activities that the NSA has undertaken. Again, I'm not a lawyer and I don't have a full uh, range of views on all their activities, but that's my understanding. Well. This question is very uh, uh, applicable to that now. Uh, when Bark Elman was here, he hinted that there were uh, likely more revelations coming. Is there still more that we do not know? <laughs> There's always more that we don't know. <laughs> and I'll leave it there. <laughs> let, well, let me uh, feel sort of refine that slightly. Yeah. Um, it is interesting that uh, there was this uh, a kind of a flood of material that uh, was uh, disclosed in the first months uh, after Snowden uh, turned it over to uh, the journalists, and that, that torrent has uh, diminished to a trickle today. Uh, and it's puzzled me, among other people. Uh, does, that me does that mean that it, the programs that are uh, sort of understandable to the layperson, the programs that, that raise fundamental civil liberties issues have all been disclosed and what remains in the literally, I think, thousands of documents that he still uh, uh, have not been revealed are things that the American people wouldn't really care about. Uh, what, what, why has this, uh, you, since you know everything. Oh, since uh, I um, there's sort of, there, is a, there is a finite uh, number of programs. There's a finite amount of time. There's a finite no number of resources. Um, I have to th now think about what I can and can't say. Uh, in, in particular, I should tell everybody here, I'm not any, at this point covered under the speech and debate clause of the Constitution <laughs> as I was when I was a But senator. you're covered by academic freedom. Is that <laughs> and, <laughs> Yeah, and if I want to come, yeah, keep faith with my talk about freedom. Um, my focus has been on, on 215 and 702 because I think they're so symbolic and they uh, have had the effect of violating Americans' uh, privacy. And that's uh, still a really crucial area where we need these reforms I've outlined. So I'm going to sidestep your question. Okay. <laughs> I w let me say, yeah, now that I've, I'm thinking out loud with you all, I'm, I did, as Senator Wyden uh, has done, and continue to push on the intelligence agencies when it comes to geolocation programs. And you make your own decision. We asked on a number of occasions, are the intelligence agencies generating and tracking uh, your geolocate, the geolocations of, of Americans? And we still haven't gotten an answer. So that's one area where the press senators, advocates, lawyers ought to keep pushing. Uh, because again, I think that's a, that's a violation of privacy if there aren't specific authorities and specific warrants uh, in place to uh, track Americans in their daily lives. Have we arrived at the point that we are essentially in a security state? That's going to be in the eye of the beholder. I think we're on a track 
if we don't stand up for ourselves and don't make it clear that we want this balance and that if we create a security state, we may have actually, in the end, uh, made it more difficult to prevail in some of the many conflicts we face in the world as Americans, uh, then, then it, we will, without knowing it, have become a security state. But I'm, I'm confident in the American people. I'm confident uh, in the efforts that a lot of us have put forward to at least draw some lines. And the debate will continue. Uh, we'll, we've, we had this debate, obviously, and we have seen this royally, 1798 with the Alien and Sedition Acts. Uh, we had it during the 70s with the church committee, and here we are back having it again. I think one of the most important fa factors is to uh, make a commitment that we'll continue to have these debates. If the debate stopped, then I think we might have a security state. So, you know, historically, this is really interesting because when Dwight Eisenhower was about to step down as president, of course, he gave a speech that's familiar to yeah. many, many people about the you know, the industrial military complex. But earlier in his presidency, he warned about the possibility that the United States would become a garrison state. Mm. And by that he meant uh, that we would become so uh, heavily invested in building arms, in uh, dealing with the Soviet threat, uh, dealing with security issues in those days, it was McCarthy and the Red mm -hmm. Scare, uh, that the, th this was his way of saying the United States in the early 1950s was at risk of becoming a security state. So it's kind of interesting to hear this echoed again today. Think, yeah, don't you think we come full circle as a society, technology changes, human nature doesn't change that much. We have 8 billion human beings on this planet competing for the basics of life as well as self-respect and opportunity. And so that we're going to continue to cycle back and have these discussions. I think the danger sign would be if we suddenly weren't having this discussion, if we were in a society where we couldn't have this discussion or we didn't care. I think that's, what, that's what's inspired me even when, I, when I've gotten to the point of, boy, this is, this is bigger than I can comprehend. I mean, there are a lot of moving parts here. Uh, we had, Jennifer was here, and, and, and she's working on the whole civil liberties front. She's got an exhaustive knowledge of this from her point of view. Phil's worked at it on it as a journalist. But we all need to be, be in the mix. We all need to be having uh, these discussions, because I think we have to be ever vigilant to protect these fundamental freedoms. So when, you know, I think a lot of people here are concerned about some of the programs that the NSA is running. Um, and certainly the CIA, uh, you know, its reputation was besmirched by the programs that they ran. Tell us, in your view, what, what is the CIA and what is the NSA doing that's right? Hmm. The CIA, if you, if you break down their, their functions, they generate intelligence, uh, that data, then they analyze it, and then they share it with uh, policy makers. Uh, they also have a covert operation arm that's the, the stuff of movies and, and novels. But the, the most important thing the CIA does is that first set of functions. And they, they do a, a really important and significant work when it comes to helping us understand foreign leaders, understand the economies and the political pressures uh, in other countries so that we're making wise decisions. Uh, whenever we can about how we interact with those countries and how we deploy Americans, Americans and American resources. Uh, the uh, NSA uh, has had uh, a number of successes, and I can say this generically, here when it comes to gathering foreign intelligence uh, that's helped us protect uh, our troops or our diplomats. Uh, and ironically, many of those successes have been d done in, in ways that comply with, I think, what many of us in this room would feel is the appropriate use uh, of intelligence capabilities that balance out security and freedom. So again, I want to underline the fact that there are a lot of Americans who work in the intelligence agencies that are there for all the right reasons. 
but it's incumbent on those of us who are policymakers and those of us who are uh, concerned Americans to continue to hold uh, our collective feet to the fire to, so that we don't overreach and we, and we don't find ourselves repeating history in the ways we've, you know, we've outlined over and over again. Um, so that, that's, but that's a, you just gave me a homework assignment now. So let me, let, let me. Because I do, I do, in a sense, my mission, I think Senator Wyden's as well, has been derived in part from wanting to ensure that the good work those agencies are doing is not besmirched by, the, by some of the overreach and, and some of the actors in the intelligence community that have taken matters into their own hands or been told to take matters into their own hands by some of the leaders at the highest levels of government. So uh, let me close with this question. Um, since 9-11, there has not been another uh, attack on the American homeland of any real significance. There have been many 9-11-like uh, attacks of some, thankfully, smaller but still horrific in other countries, London, Madrid, elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, to what do you attribute the fact that there has not been another uh, attack on the American homeland? I attribute that to a combination of um, increased vigilance here on the part not just of law enforcement and the intelligence communities, but the American people. Uh, I attribute that to the fact that our society uh, is open enough uh, and welcoming enough when it comes to diverse communities that there hasn't been the kind of incentives to attack us from within that you've seen uh, in some of the other countries uh, in Europe. Uh, I attribute that in some cases to, I don't want to say luck, but some combination of factors in a few cases that have resulted in potential acts not uh, being completed uh, to, to meet the plans of the potential perpetrator. You think of the, the shoe bomber, uh, Zazi, the gentleman who's going to try and blow up the truck in Times Square. So it's, it's been a combination of uh, law enforcement, intelligence agencies, Americans being more sensitive and, and on guard, uh, as, as well as I think a society that still uh, is, is healthy enough and, and open enough, which by the way is again part of the strength that we have, is, is every race, every religion, every culture, every ethnic group, uh, every country is represented in America. And that, that's truly, f to philosophize a little bit here, that's, I think that's an enormous strength that we have. Uh, so I think that's, that's a part of what's happening here. Now having said that, tomorrow could bring a, 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 a different day. Uh, so, but so, I think we, yeah. had, we again, back to Bin Laden, uh, remember his mission uh, was to create suspicion. Uh, his mission was to uh, incent us to build walls, keep people out who don't look like us, don't worship like us, don't eat the same foods that we eat, don't talk the way we do. And I, in the end, I think America is stronger for being willing to take the risks of being an open society with the risks that come with an open society as opposed to trying to eliminate every single threat uh, that presents itself to us. And we have, uh, in the ways in which we were attacked on 9-11, we certainly, although it's inconvenient to go through airports, we've made it much more difficult uh, to attack us in that way. And the key is gonna be to get ahead of the other kinds of emerging emerging threats. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm, you're giving me pause here in a, in a, in a good and healthy way, but. So to end on a slightly lighter note. Yeah, sir. Uh, okay, what's uh, what mountain are you going to oh, climb geez. next? <laughs> he, he is a, a, a active uh, mountain climber. Well, I made a living as a mountain climber uh, for many years. I worked for the Outer Bound System, and Mother Nature is a wonderfully powerful teacher. She doesn't care if you're cold or hungry or lost. You you have to deal with what your prospects are and, and the uh, consequences of your own own actions, but I, I've found that uh, through the years you can't smooze your way up a mountain, you can't trash talk your way up a mountain. Uh, 
you, you don't climb a mountain by accident. So there's a there's a power and there's a a reward in climbing mountains. I've climbed the hundred highest mountains in Colorado through the years, but now now that I've said that, don't get hopefully it won't be very impressive with me because there's a famous French climber who said climbers are conquistadors of the useless. Um, <laughs> His, his name was Lionel Terre for the climb, climbers here. But uh, I think I'm going to work on the next 25 highest peaks in Colorado. It gets me off the couch. It uh, gives me a reason to stay fit. And I can tell you that when you're standing on the top of a mountain uh, looking out over God's creation, it's, it's always inspirational. And it always informs uh, my actions when I'm down in the lowlands. Because I can, I can see even though I'm down in the, the valleys in so many ways. But... Uh, that's, yeah, so the next, the next 25 highest peaks in Colorado. I have no plan to go back and try. I tried Mount Everest. I killed so many brain cells in Mount Everest, I ran for public office, and look at me now. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, thank and you all. Please join me in thanking Thanks. Senator Biden. Thanks. 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 For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.